Yields up, stocks down, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. The S&P trying to recover going into the opening bell. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue, markets on edge. We worry about recession, fighting inflation, and financial stability. Some major macro headwinds. It's a difficult trinity. The Fed has been very explicit. Until we see concrete signs of inflation peaking. Until we see a change in what's happening in the labor market. They are going to be tone deaf to slowing in the economy. The markets have been looking for any window of change and pivot, and I just don't think it's there. There's no pivot. The Fed has got, to, has got to keep going. It's all about the Fed. It's all about central banks. We kind of can see this train you know, wreck in motion, in slow motion, so to speak. The difficulty of balancing growth, inflation, and financial stability. We know that the labor market is going to continue to slow, and at the same time, the Fed is going to continue to hike. Navigating through this is going to be incredibly bumpy. Moments ago, the IMF with a warning. The worst is yet to come. With more, here's Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. train wreck in slow motion and the IMF sees that happening and sees chances of avoiding it as declining. The chief economist at the IMF, Pierre-Olivier Gorinch, is saying, uh, in short, the worst is yet to come. For many people, 2023 is going to look like and feel like a recession. And that is uh, for the world. For a lot of countries, it's going to be worse. Uh, the IMF sees unusually large risks this year. Russia, of course, with the Ukraine war, continues to powerfully destabilize the global economy, they say. Inflation it should peak by the end of the year, but it's going to remain higher for longer, slower to come down. China's COVID lockdowns and a weakening property sector there are ongoing risks and monetary policy, as your guest said at the top there. The ever stronger dollar and the risk of miscalibration keep the world on edge. Their latest forecasts show that they expect slower growth and higher inflation for longer. The U.S. is going to grow 1.6 percent this year, which is a seven-tenths decline from their last forecast in July, only 1 percent next year. The eurozone barely avoids recession, as does the U.K. next year. And China going to grow extremely slowly, a little bit of a comeback, but not very much compared to what they usually do. Inflation going to come down dramatically in the U.S. with the Fed tightening from 8.1 to 3.5 percent. But in the Eurozone, it stays strong. In the U.K., it barely moves. And China's comes down just a little bit, remains high. So a gloomy forecast from the IMF, and it's summed up by the chief economist saying the worst is yet to come. As world leaders and bankers and investors gather here in Washington for the uh, annual meetings of the IMF, World Bank and IIF, it is a doer outlook from pretty much everybody. And Mike, we caught up with Mohamed al Arian a little bit earlier this morning. I want you to reflect on what he had to say. Take a listen. The economy is starting to go through the windshield. The financial system is starting to go through the windshield. Um, this is not stepping on the brakes. This is slamming the brakes. It didn't need to be this. this. This is the tragedy of it, John. It didn't need to be this way. This is a self-inflicted wound by central banks. This is going to be a reminder a little bit of October 2008, when people gather in Washington and realize we have a global problem and that yet. needs global, a global solution. And Mike, I'd love your response to that final line from Mohammed just there. Yeah, I think it's a little much to say it's uh, parallel to 2008, because then you did have Lehman Brothers going down about the time the IMF and World Bank were meeting, and that set off a chain reaction in global markets that couldn't be contained. We do have a declining economy and higher inflation now and a lot of individual problems, but nothing is systemic as that yet. His uh, analogy to a car, though, is interesting because I did a panel yesterday at the IIF and one of the members there, uh, one of the members of my panel said, you know, what's happened is the uh, Fed and other central banks missed the stop sign and now they're going straight downhill trying to step on the brakes and stop, but uh, the brakes may not work. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. That's problematic to say the least. Mike, great coverage as always. Looking forward to it through the wake and through today as well.
JP Morgan's Bob Michael started this. He's the guy we can blame. He said the following. When the central bank steps on the brakes, something goes through the windshield. The cost of financing has gone up and it will create tension in the system. Joining us now is BlackRock's Wei Lee, JP Morgan's Clinton Warren. Wei Lee, first to you. What's going through the windshield here? Well, um, in our assessment, we are in a new regime characterized by much tougher uh, trade-offs facing central banks because of the supply constraint environment that we are in. So in order to fight inflation, which is uh, the sole focus for central banks at this juncture, uh, it's going to carry much higher cost to the economy, but also financial stability. So in our assessment, to bring inflation down to targets uh, quickly enough, actually, it would require a 2% shock to the U.S. economy next year and also an additional 3 million people out of a job pushing unemployment rate to 5%. So these are the sort of very, very heavy cost facing uh, central banks, which is why we believe that in the near term, they will uh, fight inflation at all cost. But at some point uh, early next year, first half of next year, they would pause these very aggressive rate hikes as the damages from going very, very aggressively becomes clear, both to the economy as well as to financial markets. Clinton, this is the policymakers' trilemma right now. How do you support growth, get inflation down, and at the same time preserve financial stability? What gives? Yeah, it's, it's really tough out there. Um, every Monday, I, I joined a volunteer organization. We usually talk about helping the kids or special projects. And anything that everyone wanted to talk about yesterday was the recession, inflation, Jamie comments, et cetera. And I said, hey, guys, like I'll, I'll just tell you guys what I told, told, told the fellas. I said, listen, we are going through a lot. We've had two negative quarters of GDP. There's an inverted yield curve. Two, last time I checked, two to tens were 42 bips inverted. Inflation's over 8%. The Fed's behind the curve. Earning revisions are coming down. Sentiment's bad. There's a war. Like what, of course, uh, a recession probability increases at every day that goes on, every Fed hike that, that increases. And to everyone's comments, yeah, the Fed is behind the curve. They, they, they thought inflation was inflation and, uh, uh, transitory. They didn't move quick enough. And now sole focus is how do we get inflation down? Unfortunately, it's not coming down quick, uh, quick, quick as, as quick as they want or as quick as market uh, needs it to. Well, equities are meant to be the anticipatory asset class. So let's talk about what they're anticipating, Clinton, and how long they've been doing it for. The IMF is warning about something this market has been fearing for months. When do you start to lean the other way? Well, I mean, I was looking at some data here recently, and you got to you got to look at what happens in, in, in previous recessions. So, when a previous recession happens, earnings come down about thirty percent. Uh, uh, the, the consensus for twenty twenty three earnings are around two thirty. You haircut that by thirty percent, that gets you to uh, uh, earnings around one hundred and sixty. Apply a multiple to that, that gets you down to like the twenty eight hundred. So, if a recession is likely, and history is any indication there could be downside. I think at 10% uh, below from here, I'd start leaning in and start lagging in. And it all, once again, becomes back to uh, someone's uh, time horizon. If you have three, five, seven years, you know, now could look interesting. If your time horizon is a little bit shorter, you may want to sit on the sidelines because it, it's going to be a bumpy ride over the next 12 months. Wiley, what are the preconditions for you to lean in? Um, part of it is around uh, understanding when central banks could pause this aggressive um, uh, rate hike cycle, and it has two steps. Number one, central banks, uh, specifically the Fed, needs to acknowledge the very tough trade-off, exceptionally tough trade-off right now facing them. And number two, choosing to live with inflation, recognizing that hiking rates aggressively does not solve for supply bottlenecks, right? So uh, this two-step uh, process is what we're looking for for a sustained kind of pause in the aggressive uh, rate hike cycle. Now, having said that, everything has a price. Uh, yes, risks of recession have increased. We are expecting a recession. And also risks of policy uh, over-tightening, slamming the brakes have, uh, uh, in fact, become uh, the base case. The, the equities have also corrected a lot, right? So there is a level at which point we can say that actually a recession is in the price. So uh, our estimate is about another 7% actually down from here, uh, reflecting both uh, the uh, uh, higher cash path as well as uh, earnings recession that we uh, 
expect. And at that point, uh, we, we can say, well, there's a lot of bad news out there, but also a lot of bad news uh, are in the price. I'll catch up with Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley in about 21 minutes' time. Took a quote from his research to kick off the week, and this is what the quote read like. Markets often need the engraved invitation from a higher power to tell them what's going on. For the bond markets, it's the Fed. And for stocks, Clinton, it's company management teams. Clinton, do you expect management teams this earnings season to kitchen sink it with guidance? Well, I mean, it, it's just something that we've been watching very closely, and you have seen uh, numerous uh, reports from uh, C-suite executives talking about uh, controlling discretionary spending. Uh, so what will we focus on is, is what does that mean to the margins? If the consumer is still spending at a high level and, and corporations are cutting down expenses, there'd be uh, room for, for uh, uh, increased, increased earnings. Our forecast right now is that Q3 earnings come in uh, about 2% uh, higher than uh, than last quarter, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's something that we're, we're, we're watching very closely is, is not only the numbers, but more importantly, the guidance that the CEOs and TSOs get us uh, this next, uh, next couple. Clinton, just out of interest, because you brought it up and I didn't, so this is your fault, not mine, if your PR complains. How do you deal <laughs> with questions when your CEO starts talking about an extra 20% downside? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the benefits of working at a firm uh, like ours is our, our CEO calls it exactly how he sees it, and it, it's 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 made it a good place to be as as we've been the, the safe bearing of, of banks and financial assets through through most crises and, and recessions. Uh, but it, it's it's a it's a probability. It's not the base case, but it is something that people should be should be aware of. I, I do think that something that's going to be a silver lining is is the job position. Usually, when you think of recessions, you think of lost work. Uh, uh, layoffs, the consumer not being able to spend, but we know that the data doesn't show that right now. 10 million open jobs, 1.8 uh, open jobs for people looking at it. Unemployment fell. Uh, people are still uh, creating jobs. So the job thing is really is what I think is going to make this a shallow recession and something that will make a deep, uh, long recession, as some people are, are forecasting. Diplomatic. Fantastically executed. Clinton Warren there sticking with us alongside Wei Lee. Coming up on this program, markets feeling the pain as Fed hikes work their way through the economy. It's going to take some time for that cumulative tightening to transmit throughout the economy and for inflation to come down. That conversation coming up next. starting to see the effect on some sectors, but it's going to take some time for that cumulative tightening to transmit throughout the economy and for inflation to come down. And of course, uncertainty is high, so I'm paying close attention to global risk. That was the Fed vice chair offering a case for caution, pointing out aggressive rate hikes have yet to work their way through the economy. This coming as the global bond route deepens, Mohammed al Arian warning of the implications for financial stability. Once the bond vigilantes are unleashed, they tend to find tipping points. So central banks and governments have to be very aware that we are getting close to a situation where financial instability is the tail that wags the dog of the economy. Team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Mike McKee alongside Kelly Lines here in New York. Mike McKee, first to you, sir. A warning from Mohammed. A warning from Mohammed, but an answer from Lael Brainerd, although the answer came first. Uh, some hearts on Wall Street went pitter-patter yesterday when she said that because they thought maybe it means the Fed is about to back off. But really, I think what she's saying is the Fed is aware of the potential for problems that Mohammed is talking about and is taking that into uh, its uh, calculations when it's thinking about how far to go. But it doesn't mean they're stopping. You look at what New York Fed President John Williams said this past week, that the Fed's commitment to achieve and sustain 2 percent inflation is now a bedrock principle. Uh, his comments are important because the vice chair, by tradition, never dissents. So he's seen it as a bellwether for Chairman Jay Powell. The Fed's not close to its target for the year yet. Their median forecast, which they made just three weeks ago, has rates going up another 125 basis points by the end of the year. So even though Brainerd sounded maybe a hair more dovish, the markets are still projecting a 75 basis point move on November 2nd. And that bet 
could be cemented on Thursday when we get the September CPI headline forecast forecast to rise core forecast to rise a tad slower but still very strong so the dollar goes up the world still has to worry about the things breaking aspect of Mohammed's comment particularly in the bond market Caddy lines again <laughs> the Treasury market all over the place. Yeah, and of course the Treasury market is playing a little bit of catch up to what we saw in places like the UK yesterday as the bond market here in the US was closed for the holiday. And in the UK, they're really trying to deal with the, what you could probably call bond vigilantes, what Mohammed was likely referring to. The Bank of England announcing even further steps today to try to rein things in in the bond market. And yet you're seeing once again the 30 year yield in the UK pushing higher by about four basis points. And of course, we're pushing higher here in the US as well, although that has uh, up about four basis points on the 10 year worse essentially unchanged at the short end. But just on the point of where the 10 year is now and where the two year is now for that matter. Remember just a few weeks ago when we hit about 4% on the 10 year about 4.3 on the two year and everybody said, oh, that was it. The peak is now in. We're now retesting those levels. It seems time and again, we are too early to call the peak. Now, the same is also true on the 10 year real yield, which right now is at the highest level since April of 2010, up about 100 and 11 basis points over the last 30 days were around 1.66%. All of this is the market is still pricing in cuts over the next two years. Mike was just running through where the Fed is seen getting to by the end of this year, but this market is still expecting that by the end of 2023, we will have seen a rate cut and more to come in 2024, even though the Fed has tried to push back against that narrative. The market seem to think that they are right and the Fed is wrong and the inflation data we get this week probably going to make a big difference in that narrative, John. Hey, Kelly. Thank you. Kelly Lines there and Mike McKee. Kelly's right. We've placed the Fed pivot, the Fed pause, peak rates, peak inflation, 50 different ways over the last 12 months. Vice Chair Brainerd talked about how much they've already done. And we know they've done 300 basis points in the last six months. She talked about a two year through 4% for the first time since 2007, a 10 year near decade highs, mortgage rates doubling, more than doubling this year, and a Fed's broad dollar index appreciating 11% year to date. Wei Lee, I'd love your view on how much tightening you think is in the pipeline that's yet to be realized in this economy. Well, I think this long and variable lag of the transmission mechanism is also precisely why we could see over a tightening, right? So our expectation for peak rates uh, for uh, the Fed is actually uh, 5%, which is even higher than the current market pricing of um, of, uh, of peak rate. I would say one thing, though, also as we head into uh, CPI uh, this week, if uh, we have an upside surprise, it could reinforce the resolve uh, of the Fed to over tighten. Right. But if we have a downside surprise, one data point is not going to sway them from that. So there is a bit of an asymmetrical kind of a, a risk as we enter into this very, very important data print. But one more thing I would say when it comes to uh, investment implication of this is that as we head into recession, Typically, uh, investors may want to hide in government bonds because uh, that's when uh, central banks will start uh, uh, cutting rates. But this recession that we're entering into in the U.S. is likely going to be engineered by uh, central bank over tightening. So government bonds is not where we would want to hide. Long duration is actually uh, not a safe place to hide. So whilst we see kind of uh, uh, opportunities on the front end uh, of the curve because of uh, the income and carry, uh, we don't want to own the long uh, end of the curve for this precise reason. Clinton, do you agree with that? Where can you hide? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in these circumstances where uh, there's so many divergent views amongst economists, analysts, researchers, etc., you have to know and you have to take with what you're, get, what, what, what you're given. So what do we know right now? One, we know that volatility has increased. Two, we know that rates are, are higher and are moving higher. And three, we know that inflation is here and will probably be here a lot longer than any of us would like. So with, those, with that as a backdrop, uh, we are telling clients to look at structured products where you can use option packages to express a view, give you some downside protection and some upside participation. Two, uh, we kind of like core bonds here. I mean, they're, they've been boring for such a long time, but getting four, five, five and a half percent on some of your core bond exposure seems like an interesting trade to, uh, to us. And then third, uh, you got to look at real assets to fight inflation, whether it's infrastructure, transportation vehicle uh, solutions, et cetera, uh, real estate. I, I do think uh, those three things. So look at uh, structured notes to play the vol and interest rate game, lock in longer rates uh, with core bonds, and then look at real assets to fight inflation. Can I wrap things up by just asking you both the same question? Ray Dalio of Bridgewater just caught up with my colleague and friend David Weston over at the Greenwich Economic Forum, and he said that he fears a negative or poor real return 
for perhaps even five years. Wei, can I get your response to that? I think return expectations uh, needs to be uh, adjusted to reflect the higher macro uncertainty as well as the higher uh, market uh, uncertainty. Now, having said that, if you have that long an investment horizon, actually a recent uh, market volatility, public market and private market to some extent, uh, create that longer term opportunities, right? So if you have that long term uh, horizon, uh, we actually are more constructive over that long term than we are uh, tactically. So um, I, I would say, yes, uh, we have to uh, uh, adjust our return expectation to reflect the cautious assessment of the macro environment. But there are value and we want to lean into that. We're conditioned by market history, Clinton, to believe that any five-year period should be a positive one, or at least it's likely to be one. Ray Dalio questioning that. Can you give me a final word on it? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone has to remember we're still dealing with the hangover from all the stimulus that was pumped to, to save the market and the economy from uh, the, the pandemic. So we've had great returns in 2020, 21, and we're feeling some of those pains, and we're paying back some of that now. And that was a once-in-a-generation event, the pandemic, and all the stimulation that was pumped. So we're paying for that now, but if you look out three to five years, I believe in the U.S. economy, I believe in U.S. corporations, I believe in the U.S. people, I believe in the U.S. consumer, and my optimism is that we will be up higher three to five years from now. We'll check in before we finish that five-year period, no doubt, Clinton. It's good to hear from you, sir. Clinton Warren there, alongside Wei Lee. Clinton Warren of J.P. Morgan Private Bank and Wei Lee, of course, of BlackRock. That line from Ray Dalio of Bridgewater, alongside David Weston, he fears a negative or poor real return for five years. Something we'll talk about through the next couple of days. Coming up, the morning calls, that's next. And later, what a way to close out the programme in the back half. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson expecting the bear market to continue until there's further downgrades to earnings. That conversation just around the corner. And we'll catch up with Golub Capital CEO Lawrence Golub from the Greenwich Economic Forum. We'll talk to Lisa about that conversation a little bit later. From New York City this morning, good morning. Well off session lows. We were down by more than 1% earlier this morning on the S&P 500 now futures negative 16 we're down four tenths of one percent this is Bloomberg Twenty three seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning. Four day losing streak on the S&P 500 coming into today. We're down by another six tenths of one percent right now on S&P 500 futures on the Nasdaq. We're down about six tenths of one percent. We were much lower than this a little bit earlier in the session. And that's because of what was happening in the bond market. Take a look at bonds right now. Treasury yields off session highs briefly through four percent, but picking up again now at four basis points. Three ninety two forty five in the FX market. The euro trying to show some strength. Euro dollar up a tenth of one percent. 97.16 and crude negative 2.1 percent to 89. 25. That's the cross-asset price action. Let's get you some movers. Here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, between rising yields and U.S.-China tech tensions continuing to increase, escalate, we, of course, have the tech wreck continuing. Chips in particular. This is nothing new. We've seen this kind of action day after day between uh, the pre-announcements and the Asian session after those fresh U.S. curbs on China technology or China's ability to uh, gain access to U.S. technology. Uh, we see big, big declines in the Asian session. Taiwan Semiconductor plunge a record 8.3% right now down 4.8% here the ADR and it is fearing uh, sparking fears of retaliation so you can see just again continued uh, weakness KLA 10 core the semi-cap equipment company down about 4% Skywork solution the Apple uh, supplier broad based declines here John of course the socks closed at a fresh low yesterday for the year it's lowest since November of 2020 now down 44 percent the big question is what does this mean for the rest of the indexes chips of course a tell using everything that we use probably not the rosiest picture John Abby thank you we're down about a half of one percent on the S&P 500 one minute and about 30 seconds into the session pretty defensive stuff the relative outperformance from staples healthcare, utilities technology here's a line for you the S&P 500 tech sector lagging the broader index this year by the most since 2002. With more, here's Taylor Riggs. Hey, Taylor. That's not a good year that you want to be mentioning as well, John, when you mention technology. Let's dive into it. When you think about now the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ 100, the biggest of the big tech, now down for five straight days. That is the longest losing streak matching it 
of this year. Said highlights, of course, some of the recent pressure as we've been continuing to track the path of the Federal Reserve and rates higher. Take a look, and John, I think what was interesting is you talked about different sectors within tech. We've been talking a lot about the SOC, some of the chip makers lately, given the extra curbs that the Biden administration has put on some of the chip makers and how they're doing business with China. But it's also been software. So it's been hardware technology. It's really been all different facets. And it hasn't sort of been that traditional software is recurring revenue and it's a potential safe haven. That narrative has changed and it's been a little bit more of a broad based sell off. Matt Maley was out with a killer note this morning. If you take a look at where we are with the technicals, highlighting the S&P as well as the NASDAQ 100 hitting some key technical levels. The NASDAQ here, just the general composite, also looking at some major support levels. When you think about where you are for the lows of the year and trying to hold on to what has been um, at least some support levels as of late, we'll be watching that into the closing bell. Looking forward to the coverage, Taylor, with you a little bit later. As always, this market's been hammered by rates. This week, we turn to earnings. James Matthew of Aberdeen has this to say. I'm expecting more cautious and negative guidance on the basis of broad economic weakness and uncertainty and tighter monetary policy. Kelly Lines has more. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Yeah, it doesn't sound great. We are just days away now from J.P. Morgan unofficially kicking off the start of third quarter e earnings season. And the closer we have gotten to that, the more expectations have deteriorated. Back in mid-August, analysts were expecting on average earnings growth for S&P companies of about 4.3 percent. That estimate is now down at 2.6 percent, a significant slowdown compared to the 8.4 percent we saw in Q2, for example, which by and large was a better than feared reporting season. The question is whether we'll see a repeat performance of that. And if you look at the share of S&P members that have topped profit estimates, the trend has been a slow downward one. We have fewer companies beating expectations. And although JP Morgan is the unofficial start of earnings season, it's worth noting we've gotten 21 reports from S&P members already, and the average earnings surprise is negative 3.2 percent. So more companies are actually coming up short of the bar. It raises a question of whether the bar is still too high, which is what we've heard from a lot of voices here on Bloomberg TV. What a lot of the research on the sell side says is that essentially we have seen downward earning revisions. That is true. That is what we're looking here on this chart, not just the U.S., but globally. It's about 17 weeks in a row here in the U.S. that downward revisions have outpaced upward one. But the narrative is that we still have farther to go, that you need to see more deterioration in expectations as these companies face so many headwinds, including the stronger dollar, tighter monetary policy, and just a slowing growth environment that could hit demand and the ability to pass on higher input costs that remain, John. Kelly, thank you. Building on what Kelly just said there, Will we get the kitchen sink this earnings season in the guidance? Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley says this. Markets often need the engraved invitation from a higher power to tell them what's going on. For bond markets, it's the Fed. And for stocks, it's company management teams. Mike Wilson, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Hey, Mike, do we get the kitchen sink then from management teams this earnings season? Well, look, this is the question we don't know the answer to, right? We, we think we know the answer to where earnings are going. Uh, we've done a lot of work on that. That's where we have the highest conviction. Uh, I think that's where we're most out of consensus is that 2023 will disappoint. But, of course, for markets, the path in which you get there is always the question. And we think that there's plenty of evidence from a top-down perspective to do our analysis to say, hey, why don't we just cut the numbers? But as we said in this week's note, uh, somewhat you know, jokingly, but this is the way it works. You know, the, the numbers are sticky until companies throw in the towel. You know, people say, well, what's the consensus, you know, earnings for next year? Basically, what they're saying is, well, what, are the, what, is, the, what, is, the, what is the company management team guidance for next year? And, and they haven't really given us guidance. So that's why the numbers are always stale until, you know, they have, they're forced to, to make those cuts. And so this is a time of year where companies can decide to kitchen sink it, as I said in the note where they just throw in the towel, they you know cut costs and they lower the bar, or they wait until January when they have to give formal guidance for, for, the, for the full year for next year. So it's between here and there. Um, I guess you'll get some of it now. I mean, we're seeing at the individual stock level, we're already seeing that, as, as Kaylee was saying, you know, we're, we're seeing some pretty bad earnings already from those who have reported and they've thrown in the towel. So it's gonna be a mixed bag. Um, uh, our confidence on you know, where we're going uh, is high. Our confidence on the path is low. Mike, just going over that line again, for bond markets, it's the Fed, and for stocks, it's company management teams. Does that imply that you and the team believe there is a part of this market that is further along in the adjustment process? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, particularly for bonds, right? So I would say a year ago, the most mispriced market was the bond market. 
And that's why stocks overshot to the upside because rates were artificially too low. And we find it somewhat amusing, you know, uh, fixed income investors in particular are the most critical of the Fed, that, at least that's what we hear, yet they hang on every word. So which is it? Do you uh, don't think they're credible or you think they're so credible that you have to trade off of their every word? So it's really this weird <laughs> dynamic. And I would say that, uh, you know, bond markets have been chasing the Fed all year. Uh, the Fed has done their job. They've you know aggressively pivoted uh, to a very hawkish regime, uh, even more hawkish than we expected uh, at the end of last year. We were probably one of the more uh, negative folks on the bond market. So, you know, I, look, that's I think the bond market is probably there. Uh, and but unfortunately, kind of like stocks, uh, the bond market needs to be told by the Fed that they're done. Right. And uh, that's just the dance we're in right now. It's the hardest part of the cycle to trade. Uh, we think we know where we're going in equities. We think yields are probably close to topping. But we got to go through the earnings revision still, which is why you can't say that that uh, stocks have bottomed. Let's talk about margins then. One thing the bond market has been pricing over the last several months is the prospect of inflation rolling over in our future. Now, I think what matters to margins, and Mike, you've written about this a million times, is the pocket of the inflation story that sticks and the pocket of it that fades. When you think about what's going to fade here, Mike, from an inflation perspective and what's going to stick, what does it mean for margins? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we wrote a, a pretty detailed note this week, uh, in addition to our weekly around inventory, where we worked uh, collectively with our analyst teams. And, I mean, look, this has been a story that we've been talking about for nine months. We said, look, that it's like likely that the bottlenecks you know, get relieved and then we'll see too much inventory. And I think where that's most evident is in, you know, some of the apparel stocks, the retailers, uh, where consumer goods kind of across the board. And, and it's it's likely that we're going to see outright deflation in a lot of those products as uh, companies have to discount to move the extra product. Uh, I think areas where it's going to be tougher to get, you know, negative prices is going to be in, uh, say, housing uh, and rents, uh, at least on a year over year, on a uh, sequential basis. Uh, but maybe on a year-over-year -year basis, we can get them to flat. Uh, and then, of course, labor. Uh, you know, labor now does have the upper hand a bit because of the pandemic. And I, I think we've moved into a different regime here uh, where, you know, we're seeing a shift from capital to labor. Um, so I don't think you're going to see labor costs come down. You may see them flatten out. Uh, but that's, that could be one of the more defining features of this cycle, John, that uh, actually makes margins worse. And what I mean by that is, you know, U.S.-based companies are very good at cutting costs when they need to, and particularly labor costs. And because of the pandemic and the shortage of labor that may be here for a while, companies may not be in a position to do that as aggressively as they have historically. And if that's the case, then we probably see more margin degradation than even what we're modeling. And, and, and I'll just leave you with this. I think that the area of the market that uh, a lot of clients are uh, perhaps underestimating is negative operating leverage. Uh, inflation increases operating leverage. However, operating leverage can cut both ways. It was positive in the lockdown uh, during the pandemic, and now it's in a negative cycle. And we think that's where even we could be underestimating the downside to margin pressure because of that negative operating leverage story, and labor is part of that. Mike, that is a very different market regime than what we've experienced recently and in years before as well. What does that mean for leadership within the equity market, Mike? Where does it come from? Yeah, well, it, it's more the same of what we've been saying all year, John, and you know this well, which is we're very focused on companies that have what we call operational efficiency. Uh, they have their hands on cost. Uh, working capital is not eating up their cash flows. Another feature of what we're seeing right now, they're, they're very good at running their businesses. And that's an idiosyncratic feature. It's not a sector feature per se. Now, some sectors uh, can defend their margin position or operational efficiency better. Those tend to be the more defensive areas, where like healthcare is an example. Uh, some of the managed care uh, businesses look quite good in that regard to what they've traded well. Um, I would say uh, clearly some of the staples and beverages, uh, you know, but that's, you know, that's where we are. And then, of course, when we get to the trough, you're going to want to flip it exactly the other direction because we're not in the camp. I think you were saying a minute ago, we're going to have like negative returns or flat returns for the next five years. That could be true point to point, uh, particularly on a real basis after inflation, but there's going to be tremendous uh, trading opportunity on the upside, just like there was in 20 and 21. However, we're still in the down cycle right now. So the way we're thinking about the next five years, John, which is probably different than most, is we're in this boom-bust period. And we're in a bust period right now. We'll get through it, and then there's going to be another boom. So you know, as soon as you get your head around on the bust, it's probably time to start thinking about the upside. And that could be within the next three to five months. Well, Mike, this is the perfect time to have this conversation then, because right now on my screen, we're making new lows for the year. The new low for the year 
35.82 on the S&P 500. Are you saying in the next few months, Mike, you could change course? And I think we should build on that a little bit more because the risk, as always, as you know, is to become married to a worldview, super bearish, become married to the position. You can't make the turn to come back into the market. Mike, I know that you haven't done that over the last couple of years. You were super bullish out of the pandemic and then you turned. What's going to make you turn, Mike? What's going to make you that little bit more bullish to have that rip that you're looking for? Well, the same thing we did in 2020 or that we did in 2017, you know, when we found ourselves out of consensus, it's, you know, you're, you really are sold out. We could argue we are now, but then our fundamental metrics are telling us that we're at a rate of change low. Um, so we've been, we're pretty disciplined around that. We don't get everything right, but you know, one thing we tend to not, we tend, we tend to be early. We're usually not late. Um, of course, right now being early can be quite painful. I, I you know, I don't want to get you know get too bullish here because people then won't construe my words to say, hey, you know, here it's time to go, and and that's not what we're saying. We're saying there's still you know the last couple of innings of this bear market could be quite painful, okay? But you got to be ready for when that price gets to an attractive level. If it was five percent away, John, I would say fine. But we still think you know kind of low three thousands, even three thousand is really where we're probably going, and so. You know, as we go through 3,400, 3,300, kind of towards the low 3,000s, we've heard other people kind of throw those numbers out too, kind of nonchalantly. It's like, that's a big move, you know. I mean, you know, so you don't want to be too early in sort of getting uh, getting your head around on that. But the things we're looking for the most is rate of change on earnings growth and revisions. Uh, valuation could be the other way we get there, which is how we got there during the pandemic. You know, equity risk premium really blows out. And then, of course, we'll, we'll start to see, you know, the whites of, the eyes in terms of say economic growth, which will pit, which will actually cause the Fed to pivot. They're not there yet. Okay, so those are three things that we're very focused on, and it's just the, the cake is just not baked yet. We're going to talk to you before that cake gets baked, I'm sure. Mike, thank you, sir. As always, Mike Wilson there from Morgan Stanley on this equity market. We're down for a fifth straight session on the S&P. We're down three quarters of 1%, and we have new lows for 2022. Up next, Gollum Capital CEO Lawrence Gollum joining Lisa Abramowitz from the Greenwich Economic Forum. Looking forward to that from New York. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Pierre Olivier Gorincha, IMF chief economist. That conversation at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, 3.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. A fifth day of losses on the S&P 500. 17 minutes into the session, a new low for 2022. That low was 35 82. On the markets on this story, picking things up now is Lisa. Hey, Lisa. Hey, John. Uh, thanks so much. We are right now speaking with someone who has a real feeling and entrenched in the uh, economic fibers of particularly smaller and mid-sized companies. Lawrence Golub, CEO of Golub Capital, uh, joining us here in Greenwich, Connecticut from the Greenwich Economic Forum. And I'm curious for you, from your standpoint, with a credit focus on smaller companies, as you hear about all of the fear in markets, are you getting more aggressive or less aggressive in your investments? Well, thanks, Lisa. It's great to be here with you. Right now is an increasingly good time in our business. You know, the lending business is cyclical. You want to lend not against the frothy top of performance, and you want to lend not at the most extremely high leverage levels. You want to lend money when companies that are borrowing the money can put it to excellent use. And uh, the, the economy right now really is pretty good. Uh, you can't have a bad economy and 3.5% unemployment. Interest rate sensitive sectors, which are not where we really invest, are having, having some struggles. But we're trying to be especially active problem solving for our private equity firm clients as they have, especially as they have portfolio companies that are growing by acquisition. And I was speaking about this with Jim Zelter. The, the, the complication comes when you're lending for five years at a time when the economy is moving very quickly. And I'm wondering from your perspective whether that duration has shrunk, whether you're less willing to invest for a longer period of time as the ambiguity of perhaps three to half percent unemployment now uh, could turn into something vastly different a year or two from now. Well, for us, it's all about margin of safety. It's, it's about margin of safety in terms of how high can floating rates rise before you have interest coverage 
problems. It's about how many mistakes a management team can make or how many unlucky things can happen. We certainly don't know what inflation is going to be four years from now. We run all the models. We do sensitivities. The margin of safety in loans we make today, given the wider range of possible outcomes, we try to make bigger than, than we would in some other times. That margin of safety, of course, a lender's margin of safety is a borrower's problem, potentially. So there's always give and take. Well, that's exactly what I was going to actually ask. How high are yields? I mean, if you're looking at public markets with 10 percent uh, average yields for speculative grade credit, how high are yields in private markets? So a typical loan that we would a new loan that we would make now would have a, a interest rate margin of SOFR plus six and a half percent. SOFR on a forward curve is going to be four, four and a half percent next year. So you're talking about an 11 percent floating rate yield in our asset class, which is super attractive because it's first lien, senior secured, and floating rate. If SOFR goes to five and a half, that 11 goes to 12. So you have built-in protection against inflation. The, the private credit markets are pretty attractive on a risk-adjusted return basis right now. You raise the issue of if yields go too high, it becomes a problem for the borrower, which is a reason why uh, when yields go way too high, it can become a problem. Based on what you're seeing, uh, just in the nuts and bolts, I know you put out a mid-market report, you start to look and strip away uh, the large uh, storylines and actually look at the details. How well or how not well are companies doing in this very quickly moving cycle? We, you, we're seeing greater dispersion. We're seeing greater dispersion between industries. We're seeing greater dispersion among companies within industries. I think one of the things that our business is based on is lending to private equity-backed businesses, which helps a little bit because private equity firms are very good at noticing issues and intervening in issues. Uh, but for sure, at, as SOFR approaches 4.5%, there's less room to maneuver, uh, especially if a company has borrowed a very high multiple of adjusted EBITDA and not all those adjustments have come to pass and all of a sudden they're looking at an 11 percent interest rate on what was six or seven times adjusted EBITDA but might be eight times real EBITDA. I mean, fortunately, this is when your skill as a credit underwriter comes into play. You don't want to have made those loans. Are there certain areas you will not touch right now because the industry is just flat on its back in a way that people might not appreciate? So we, we really stay away from businesses that rely on consumer tastes and consumer preferences. So, for example, we do a lot of mission-critical business-to-business software, but we won't do business-to-consumer software. And there are parts of business-to-consumer software that are booming. There are some that have you know, hit some bumps. We're just not smart enough to pick the winners and losers and back to the five years. Even if we were smart enough to pick winners and losers, we're not smart enough to pick five years' worth. But are there industries where traditionally you have liked them occasionally, but have seen deterioration that is so dramatic that it has you concerned? Well, specialty retailers who are mall-based, uh, businesses that have very high demands on uh, lower-skilled labor content. You know, we would have, for example, probably considered a loan to a franchisor who had a lot of operations in California. With California's minimum wage increases, you've got to worry about the health of the franchisees. So something like that we, we'd be more conservative about right now. And what are you concerned about going forward in terms of this default cycle, right? I mean, a lot of people talk about where we are. Where are we in terms of the repricing, let alone uh, companies actually running into trouble? So we're, we're expecting muddling growth. If we have muddling growth, we're not going to have a massive default cycle like we did in the financial crisis. Uh, I, th I think what we're looking at are company-specific issues where the early intervention can really make a big difference by figuring out, do they need more capital? Should the company be sold to an industry player? Uh, I think that we have to keep our eye on inflation because inflation correlates with what SOFR is going to be in the future. I mean, we're all very concerned about interest rates going up, but uh, SOFR is still negative in real terms. If you look historically at Fed funds, the historical average of Fed funds before the financial crisis was 5 percent. We're not even up to average yet. You said that you uh, work with a lot of companies that are private equity backed. Yes. Those that are not, do you find that they have a harder time getting equity investments and are turning to debt more frequently, that you're getting better terms and that you're having a uh, you know, better claim on a company simply because private equity, perhaps, is in that much more of a world of hurt? 
I wish, but not the case. Uh, private equity borrowers are so tough and smart. They don't let us get away with anything. We have great relationships. I mean, we've done multiple deals with over 200 private equity firms. But they're looking for a reliable partner who helps the portfolio companies grow. They're not giving anything away. And private equity firms uh, don't, don't have a shortage of debt capital. I think one of the interesting trends that will play out over the next 12 months is the pace of new deals by private equity firms. Right now, the S&P is, is approaching new session lows. We are seeing the sell-off accelerate as yields continue to climb. At what point will you move away from floating rate loans and start to uh, want to have fixed rate instruments again? We won't. We're in the floating rate business. We sure. match fund. Uh, we, we take the inflation issue. We take the interest rate risk off the table as traditional senior secured lenders. So we won't do that. I think that that uh, the, the degree to which we take some junior capital risk, whether that's floating rate or fixed rate, is a little bit cyclical. And to us, that's less about what interest rates are doing and more about our own thinking about forward profit growth. In our middle market report, you know, we had very robust growth in revenue, but the growth in profit was not was really not that great. And now it's comparing to a year ago, which were boom times, but we're having an economy now where the economy is growing, GDP is growing, interest rates are going up, but it's getting harder and harder to achieve profit growth. Yeah, another way of saying uh, margin compression. Lawrence Golub, thank you so much of Golub Capital. John, back to you. Hey, Lisa. Thank you. Great work this morning. Thank you very much. New lows for 2022 on the S&P 500, 35.78. Just off those lows right now, the S&P down by nine-tenths of 1%. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.